Hello and welcome, camera one, camera two, to a brand new series, Restring Sundays. Every Sunday there's going to be a new guitar on the table and we're going to restring it, talk a little bit about the history of the guitar and uh, just overall guitar stuff. Well, you're probably wondering what guitar is in this pretty beat up and old looking case? Well, it's a channel favourite. It's been in the majority of my videos, at least in the background of them. And uh, a lot of people have been asking to take a closer look at it. So that's exactly what we're going to do today. Okay, so this guitar is commonly referred to as an Ibanez Lawsuit Era guitar. Even though there was never a lawsuit, just a cease and desist, a letter telling Ibanez to stop what they were doing, and they did. No lawsuit, but still lawsuit era guitar. So let's start off about the significance to this guitar for me personally, and then we'll move on to the guitar historically in the instrument sector. Is that a B? You like jazz? It is a B. In 1982, my dad, who was 15 at the time, asked for an electric guitar for Christmas. This is what he got. My granddad bought it for him in Goodwin's Music, and it cost him £130. At the time, this guitar was about 10 years old, and uh, was second-hand. He didn't know what he was buying, it was just a guitar that was there and fit into the budget. And even then, the budget, 130 Irish pounds at the time would have been about two-thirds of his wages. But this was the guitar he got, and this was the guitar that was eventually handed down to me. I played my first ever live show with this. I was 12, it was like a school performance. And I played a Thin Lizzy melody of uh, Boys Are Back In Town and Jailbreak. Those were the riffs I knew. <laughs> So that's the significance of this guitar for me. Let's talk about the guitar itself and the broader picture of things. Restring time. We're gonna put on the new Daddario XS series. These are fully coated strings and we'll use tens. Player's circle code for someone. Now according to an Ibanez catalog, this guitar was released in 1971 along with a whole host of other Ibanez copies. At the time, Ibanez really wasn't anything other than a guitar copy brand. There were obviously the Gibson copies, but there were Strats and there were Rickenbackers as well. And this specific guitar was made between 1971 and 1974. This was before any serial numbers were a thing. This specific guitar was model 235IM in a brown sunburst is what it was described, but it's more red. It's kind of brown, but it's more red. There were four Bolton Les Paul copies in that range. This was one of them. But what differentiated this from the other three was the pickup selection. You might notice, and a lot of people think, that the pickup has been changed. The bridge pickup, it doesn't match the neck. But this is a stock guitar. There were no modifications made onto this. It's a very interesting pickup. It was listed as high power. That's really all it was about. Now this particular guitar, the bridge pickup is actually lower output than the neck pickup, but that might have something to do with the contacts on the switch for how long it was just in storage in an attic for, I don't know, like 30 years. It is an old one, we have to factor that in. The pickups do sound really good though. The pickup itself, you notice that the paint is worn off where it's been played, and this body is brass. What's really interesting historically, and we'll talk about this in a future video, the bobbins are cream, stock, cream, 1971. So you might ask, why did Ibanez get a cease and desist? Why is this a lawsuit guitar? You might think, well, it's because it looks like a Les Paul, and it does. But that wasn't the reason why. It was specifically two trademarks that Ibanez were infringing on that were Gibsons, and this all happened at the headstock. The two trademarks were the Bell truss rod cover, Gibson have a trademark on that, and this open book headstock design. You'll only find that on a Gibson headstock, and one of these. Interestingly, the Ibanez logo, this is the old Ibanez logo, but it's not the original Ibanez logo. The 60s Ibanez logo actually looks a whole lot more modern than this older one. Now, while I oil the board, let's talk about the other guitars that surpassed this. Now, in 1975, this guitar was all but discontinued, but it was replaced with something very, very similar. 
instead of the inlay on the headstock that's there, they had some text and it looked very much like Les Paul text. And the only other difference that I can see is they had the two matching high power pickups instead of the stock mismatched that this guitar had. It was really the only change, but that guitar lasted a year before they got their cease and desist letter from Gibson. Very low frets on this particular board. That is something to do with playing, but they were originally, they weren't like tall frets. These were fretless wonder type. By 1976, Ibanez changed the model again, the main differences being the headstock. They changed the headstock completely and they changed the truss rod cover too. Interestingly though, that same year, 1976, they released more Gibson copies, full range of Carina copies, even though the, the bodies were actually made out of ash, they were just dyed to look like Carina. They did the Vs, they did the Explorers. However, at that point, Gibson had caught onto them and that was quickly shut down. That really only lasted a year. By 1977, they were gone out of the range. And by 1978, Ibanez had to start introducing their more original shapes. And we got the Iceman shape out of that. So it wasn't all bad, was it? Best smelling guitar cleaner. Everyone does lemon oil. This smells like coconut. Now, one of the most noticeable stickers on this particular instrument is this one right here. It's a Mama's Boys sticker. Mama's Boys were a band from Ireland that uh, had decent enough success in the country and even toward America at one point during the 80s. A sad story though, it was made up of three brothers and the drummer died. So that was the end of Mama's Boys, but the two other players, the guitar player Pat McManus and the bass player John McManus have continued their respective solo careers. This is a mahogany neck with a rosewood fretboard, bolt-on mahogany body made in Japan. And what's interesting about this guitar is that you might be able to hear this, the top is hollow, it's an arched top, not a carved top. More solid in the middle and then... This guitar was made in the 70s, so it's got that pancake body two-piece. But actually what surprised me is that Ibanez fixed the Gibson brake angle on the headstock. It's not this really harsh angle that the Gibsons were. It doesn't have a volute either. They just lessened the angle. You might be able to see it through the paint on the headstock. This neck is a three-piece mahogany neck as opposed to just the one piece. Just realized that the camera cut out, so I'm gonna have to mention something again and hope that it gets it this time. It's an Ibanez, so it was made in Japan, an original Ibanez at that. And I just think it's kind of interesting that guitars from Japan used to be viewed as much less and inferior to anything made, and now they've got this huge cult following, specifically these old Ibanezes, but really, anything that's made in Japan. Jackson just released a line of Japanese made guitars and uh, they're very expensive. And you'll see this time and time again with guitars that were originally made in Korea and were viewed as nothing but beginner guitars. And those same factories are now making the high-end guitars that you can find. So it's really interesting how that goes because it's a good piece of history now that they're over 40 years old, or at least some of them. Maybe this one, maybe it's a few years shy of that, we can't tell. Not only is it a piece of history uh, for Ibanez, showing where they came from, but it also could be viewed as a little bit of history for Gibson, because this was one of the first lawsuits, well, even though it wasn't a lawsuit, cease and desist, but still, one of the first times that they were uh, being authentic. <laughs> Just want to stress that Gibson weren't in the wrong. This was 100% absolutely a Les Paul copy and it 100% had infringing trademarks. There is no debate about that. It's just, I, it's funny. So I'm gonna get this one strung up and string stretched out and then we're gonna play it. If you would like to see more videos like this, there's gonna be one hopefully every Sunday. And uh, which guitar would you like to see next? I'm thinking about the Jackson RR24. That's another made in Japan guitar with an interesting story. Anyway, uh, subscribe, like the video, let me know about things in the comments and uh, I'll see you next time. 
Bye-bye. <laughs>